Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fun and Games Podcast. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I'm Matt A.K. Stormageddon. And you're listening to our E3 2021 wrap-up special. We hadn't quite figured out exactly what we're calling it, but I think a wrap-up special is kind of what we're what this is. <laughs> yeah, we, for the first time ever, got official, for whatever that means, E3 access. We were both able to cover the event, access the E3 portal, book appointments with developers, and some other stuff in theory. Uh, I say in theory because this is the first time E3 has ever gone fully digital, and to say that it was not smooth would be a vast understatement uh yeah absolutely there was a lot of even signing up for the press badge from from the word go there was just we don't need to go into the details there was just a lot of weird little kinks and and rough edges on that and then once we could access the portal once the press week started even that was a little dodgy Yeah, I've spoken to a bunch of folks, professionals in and outside the industry who have done E3 many years before, said that most of their booked appointments, they got through existing contacts. The portal wasn't really great for navigating to get interviews. Um, Lucky for me, um, and we'll feature these later, we'll talk about them. I got to do a couple of dev demos and chats for some indie games, and those came straight into my inbox. They pulled a list of emails, fired off an email about their games, and I replied booking an appointment. Like it was, it had little to do with the portal itself, though my email being a part of that was because I was signed up. So that alone at least brought those several encounters to fruition. Absolutely. I mean, I actually, I think on, it opened up for us the Monday before the whole weekend of E3 that was public. I think around Wednesday, I couldn't log in anymore. Just, I don't know if the site crashed or something, but every single page I loaded got this very weird syntax error message. So I just went, well, well, I'll, I'll cover what I can find. And Matt, I'm really glad you were able to get those interviews. I'm really excited about both of the games, Coromon and Bark Bio Interstellar Arc. And we'll talk about those in a couple of minutes. And I mean, honestly, the indie games are the things that I'm super excited about. And I'd love to bring some of the people behind those games on future episodes. Yeah, for sure. And I spoke to those developers and asked off air if they'd be interested in coming on the show. And they, of course, said yes. And so hopefully more on that later this year. I do want to say, though, what was fun about covering E3, which Jeff and I might or might not have done before, is that, you know, without getting this access, at least, is that a lot of the big things to talk about, you don't need a press badge to access. All of the big conferences are digital and have been digital for a while and were broadcast even when they weren't digital and only online. And we were probably going to talk about those things anyway. Um, It'll be nice to have the insights of being able to share those interviews at the end of the episode. But the big stuff that we're going to talk about most folks saw because it is broadcast on Twitch and on YouTube and wherever else you can find game-related things. Yeah, that accessibility is already there, which means that, I'll be honest, E3 2021 is sort of a weird growing pains, intermediate stage of a convention, of a conference, because on the one hand, watching the the day by day of the public E3 conference was it felt a little bit like watching ESPN in a really bad way. But yeah, the thing is going at it as press actually being physically there. Part of that is getting to see the games firsthand, getting to talk to everybody, getting those sort of interviews and commentaries independently and having it presented as it was felt a little forced a little false i'm not sure exactly what there were some great segments there were some good interviews that went on but i think also all of us are exhausted by zoom at this point as much as we want to say that no no we would like some good information comes of it cool but those things can also live piecemeal where do you want to know more about this game about this title here it is And you can go and find that. I appreciated any of the trailers, any of the presentations that were quick, that got to the point of things, got to the heart of it. I know E3 is about being able to get into the nitty gritty, but because it's streamed and because we don't quite have the same tactile access, even having access to the press portal, you and I, Matt, it's a very different, I would assume, situation. And so it kind of feels a little clumsy. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. And I think the difference between this and other conferences like PAX that went online over the last year is that 
that's a fan convention. For all intents and right. purposes, with all the industry stuff at PAX, it's fans first. Whereas E3 is an industry convention. Like, fans can go, but that was over, that was more recent. You know, in the early days, it was only industry. And, like, look, I'm glad that we got to be a part of it. I'm glad that now, hopefully, because we'll have some coverage to point to when it's in real life next year, maybe we'll get to go to L.A. in person and cover it, which would be incredible. I'd be super excited about doing that. Seeing the games, getting one-on-one time or small group on one time with with certain (laughs) developers and creators i always love some of my favorite moments of conventions is especially video game conventions is going to the indie booths and just getting to chat with people and getting to hear their personal take on the game you know sometimes if you're recording they have the canned answers but you also get a much better sense of connection with the game and then we as the I don't know, journeyman journalists of putting this stuff out there, we then carry on that enthusiasm. It's a little more difficult to carry that enthusiasm the way it's presented now. Yeah, and that seemed to be the general consensus around industry folks that I know and even industry folks that I don't. Uh, Those who've listened to the show for a long time know that I'm a fan of Waypoint, Vice Games' podcast and portal. Um, And they did E3 coverage in person together. They're all vaccinated, so they got together at least for the weekend to talk about stuff and talk over the conferences. And like, you know, Austin Walker's been in this industry a long time. Patrick Kupik is like a legend in the industry. He's been around forever and work has worked almost everywhere. Both of them were just talking about how this just doesn't feel the same. They love the half hour of commercials as much as anybody else because it's fun to get excited. Like there's a little bit of cynicism, but for the most part, you want to be excited at the surprises with other people. Right. But they said there's just a lack of uh, you know, personal touch to the fact that even though they're together, they're not on the show floor, they're not meeting people in person. And Patrick especially was saying, like, I want to meet these developers. Like, yeah, I love these big games, but I want to meet this one man developer who's making this niche thing that I, I had no idea about until I went to the event or meeting fans of the show who I never really get to talk to except every once in a while on Twitter because I'm so busy. Like, that kind of interaction is just absent and it just doesn't feel the same. And having gone to PAX East right before the pandemic started, I loved that experience. And I I was gearing up to replicate that experience across multiple conventions throughout the year. Womp womp. Huh. But like this gave me some of that excitement again because then also at night, like I would chat with some of my friends who are other podcasters or journalists, like, oh, what'd you see? What do you like? And like I got to, on the Discord, you know, hang out with Alex Lavelle of our very own podcast network for a couple of the conferences. You, me, and Alex hung out for the Nintendo one. And, like, that, that I want to do more of that stuff, too, because that was fun. And I feel like if it's digital again next year or if we can't go next year, maybe do, doing more live streams, more coverage, more maybe a live episode of Fun and Games where we talk about each conference for, like, a half hour after it airs or something. Like, who knows? Like, But this made me excited for video games, even though the cynicism is in the back of my head. At the end of the day, I was happy to be a part of it. And I was encouraged to be happy about it, even though, you know, E3 has not always run things great or well. There was still that general excitement in the air for all of the stuff. Absolutely. There's no no convention or conferences run perfectly, and none of them are going to be everything to everyone. But... I definitely feel you on that matter of, yes, E3 can generate so much excitement, so much hype. What do we do with it now? There's just sitting down and basically binge watching trailers is, let me tell you, for me, I get antsy real quick on that kind of a thing. I imagine if I was in a room watching it with people, watching the Nintendo Direct with with all y'all was was a lot of fun. We could make some commentary. We could enjoy it together. But yeah, as as it stands now, I hope that things progress so that the excitement that E3 generates, we are better able to utilize it. When journalists are there and it's, we're so excited about these games. Let's go talk to the people behind it. Let's put that out there. Let's put that forth. That's That's the ideal. That's the goal. And I definitely felt moments of that. But I I remain optimistic about how much better it will be in the future. This was, they had to cancel E3 last year because of everything. And this year, I would rather it be like this than rushing in-person stuff. Because you know what? We've gone on record about how the video game industry can put personal safety and health 
behind the hype, yeah. beneath the hype. So this is good. <laughs> all told, my gripes aside, I feel ultimately very good about it. Same. I do too. Why don't we get into some of the nitty gritty of the stuff we saw? Do we want to start with some of the major conferences? Do you want me to talk about the indie games I saw? How do you want to go about this? Well, one thing I do want to talk about in light of how E3 was this year, everything, even in-person E3, there's a bit of like, who won E3? Who had the best uh, keynote <laughs> speech? Who had the best showcase? Uh, what were some of your favorite showcases? Like as a whole, how they presented it, what they did with it. Not just the games, but what they did. That's a great question. So, I mean, I think my my top ones are the Xbox Showcase and the Xbox Bethesda Showcase because they are one mm -hmm. one family now. They are one. <laughs> and the Nintendo Direct because Nintendo has gotten very good at their directs. And when they have stuff to be hyped about, there's stuff to be hyped about. I would say that the, the poorer showing of presentations, I would say, is probably, you know, Square Enix Showcase was fine, but it was, you know... The, it was kind of uh, lopsided. It was not evenly spread out. And then I would also say, like, the smaller ones weren't too bad. Like, the Wholesome Direct was okay, and the Future Game Show was fine, and the PC Game Show was fine. That was all kind of like an amalgamation of stuff. But, like, even Ubisoft's presentation was kind of meh. Yeah. Look, at the end of the day, I'm going to miss Reggie fils forever. Because he, no, <laughs> nobody put on a presentation like Reggie fils did, especially, especially at E3. And so... I felt that missing and like Doug Bowser wasn't a part of it this year. It was it was led by other folks, which makes total sense. But it's just there was something about that energy that that I missed. As far as standout moments, there are so many. But like, what were some of your favorite conferences? Who do you think presented the most interestingly? I mean, Nintendo is also a favorite of mine from this conference, mostly because, yeah, they've kind of perfected their art or have slowly developed and are developing the art of the Nintendo Direct so that in a situation like this, they already had this set up and figured out. I enjoyed some of the larger ones. Yeah, Xbox Bethesda put up some good games and some good stuff, but it felt like a lot. Mm -hmm. It felt almost slow, almost because, again, if I am in the room while they're giving these sorts of speeches, fine. Take as long as you want. Let let the four-minute Stalker 2 trailer wash over me. <laughs> but if I'm sitting at my desk, if I am at home, if I'm on my phone, if I'm whatever watching this, I'm getting very antsy very quickly. Yeah. And I noted, I, I, I remember noting uh, when we were watching the Nintendo Direct Live that in less than 40 minutes, they introduced 27 games or 22 games, whichever it was. And I was like, that's, that's, that's a great ratio. The Xbox Bethesda, they released, they announced around the same in two and a half hours, an hour and a half, something like that. It was, it was a, a much longer one. And... And kind of going against what I just said, I really enjoyed the Indie Showcase. Yeah. Because that one was a little more patchwork. They didn't spend too much time on the behinds of any one of the games. You got a little bit of the voice behind of the people behind it. Yeah. It wasn't just a, here's a AAA title, and now we're going to spend the next 10 minutes talking about it. Here's a game. Here's some people behind it. Here's a game. And because it's the different companies and because it's the different studios, there's a lot to check out there. And also the ideas behind it. I I'm most excited about those games, about the indie titles. And getting to see the showcase and knowing that a couple of those, that you'd already gotten to see the gameplay and talk to those people, made me all the more excited about it. And honestly, some of my favorite showcases watching of E3 were the E3 adjacent stuff. Mm -hmm. I also watched the limited run games and the Devolver Digital keynotes, as it were. And I don't; those were not on the official E3 schedule, but I loved both of them. They were incredible, and I know that that is a cop out answer, but God damn it, Devolver Digital puts on a good E3 show. This is their fifth one, and Matt, have you watched these? Yeah, they're like narratives, essentially. Like, like they have stories. There is a there is a cinematic universe to their keynote speeches. Yeah. That, you know what, minor spoiler for this one, if you haven't watched it yet, they completely throw out the window intentionally and horrifically at the beginning of, of this year's. Yeah. And it also was one that I watched it and I just went, oh my God, they came for blood for the industry, for people like you, people like me, for everyone I know. And I love it. And 
they also announced a game that is going to be physical only, which, you know what? Uh, the, yeah, they came for me. Yeah. But that's a little unofficial. So I would probably say my favorite favorite was the indie game showcase. I mean, that makes sense. And like uh, official, unofficial. I mean, this whole week I kept asking my friends, what is this? Is this part of E3? And they would shrug like the Summer of Games thing that Jeff Keighley hosted was not yeah. part of E3, but also had a ton of announcements. And then like both Summer of Games and E3 were claiming that the Xbox showcase was part of theirs. Like it was a little, yes. it, it was a little bit of a cluster this year. Yeah, I definitely, you know, f- full disclosure, listeners, if you're listening to this the day it's released, we are recording it two nights before a, a day and a half beforehand. I am doing a hell of an editing job <laughs> on this. Uh, anyway, the the fact is, so today I had in my schedule like things I need to look at, stuff I was doing, whatever. It's like, oh yeah, that Steam Next thing. I guess that's something to do with E3. I guess no, it's not. Nope, that's that's its own thing. Yep, that's 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 Steam, and it has nothing to do with this. And also trying to log on to that on a cheap Chromebook was a terrible idea. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm I'm excited about whatever they're announcing too. But it's not E3. It's just this is the time to be announcing things, and I like that about E3. Whether or not I'm into the specific large tentpole companies announcing their exclusives or the update to whatever game that's been out for three years for games as service subscription crap, the fact that it is also a time when other people can go, hey, you're all excited about game announcements? Cool. I'm over here. Want to check it out? It's only like 10 minutes. Come on. Come on, check it out. Over here. Yeah. And you see all kinds of cool shit. I love that. That environment. That's probably one of the best things to come out of this year's digital E3. The fact that that's equal footing. Yeah. Because we got so confused. So it must be equal footing. There's no other reason. Right. Of course. And I agree. I think that the reason I got excited about a lot of the tentpole stuff is just because my brain has been in the tentpole place. And now, of course... We haven't mentioned Sony at all because famously, I think they did this last year also, Sony has not done an E3 presentation in a while. They did their Horizon Forbidden West thing last month, which was just about the one game and not about anything else coming out. They also, before that, did a a lengthy presentation on the new Ratchet and Clank. So like that's kind of how they've been running things. And so there was not a ton to get excited about when it comes to Sony, other than what we already know. But going into diving into the showcases more specifically, the reason that the Xbox Bethesda showcase got me so excited is because I was surprised time and time again during that showcase and saw things that I knew I'd be excited for, but didn't realize how excited it would make me. For example, for those who have been following me on social media, they might remember that early this year and late last year, I was playing a lot of Forza Horizon 4, which is essentially an open world game, but with cars. Like it's, you know, you can do different missions, you can do different races, stunt driving, you can go on adventures and exploring and all of your friends are imported as computer racers whenever you do anything. It's very cool, very pretty, it was a lot of fun. When they announced Horizon 5 this year, at this year's E3, it was so beautiful, it was such a good presentation. It was delivered well, like it it wasn't just gameplay footage for, five minutes it was there was a developer interview there was an interview with one of the voice actors like talking about what they're excited about with it and that really wrapped me in a way that i hadn't been before and made me go i want an xbox series x i want to be able to chill on my couch play forza horizon 5 turn on one of the radio stations in the game and just groove and enjoy it and that was not a feeling i expected then there were trailers that i didn't know were coming like redfall which is a new four player co-op va- vampire hunting game that had no gameplay but the the writing of this cutscene that we watched essentially this fmv was well done it was interesting it was funny it was clever and then outer worlds 2 i loved the first outer worlds i talked about it a lot yeah yeah their trailer was making fun of e3 trailers it was literally yes. point for point now you're going to see a giant monster that you'll never see again. Here's a wide sprawling shot. Now we're going to pan out. Here's something cool in slow motion. We don't really have anything for you, but we have a title. And then it showed the title right. and that was it. And I appreciate that. It's I know sometimes fourth wall breaking or the sort of like postmodern ish lean on on those sorts of things can get tiresome. But if you're big enough, I'll go with it. And especially because Edel Worlds 2 had a trailer and Fallout 76 had an update trailer. And I can't think of a better, I can't think of a better uh, bit of irony or a joke or whimsy on that. But here we are. Especially considering they're both the same company, different studios within the company, but the same company. 
Um, right. Yeah, I love and I loved the first Outer Worlds, which didn't didn't get a, a lot of love, but I really enjoyed. And so, like, I was just happy to see that there was a trailer because I had no idea. And then, of course, a game that I know we were both excited about that's coming to Xbox first and PC is Psychonauts 2, which had yes. tons of gameplay features, a story trailer. We got to see moments. We got to see new abilities like they really took their time to show it off. I don't believe we got, I don't know if there's an official release date for it yet, but I think it's August-ish or late this summer is the anticipated it's, time. I, th I think you're right. I think it's this summer. But like, this is a game that you and I have talked about quite a bit, and we're both fans of all of, you know, Double Fine's work. They've been doing work for a long time. And so to be able to come back to a world that I never thought we'd get to revisit is really exciting. And to see it during the showcase was also really exciting. Oh, yeah. No, I'm very pumped about Psychonauts 2, it, especially because Double Fine's been kind of plugging away since the first Psychonauts. And I remember getting it. I remember being so excited about it. I remember being like, everyone needs to play this. I love Tim Schafer's work. And oh, my God, you know, I totally fanboyed for that way back when. And it's satisfying. There's a lot of series and a lot of games that are getting another life, another lease on things coming back after a long hiatus. Speaking of release dates and long hiatus and everything else, real quick, we need to take a moment and just be very excited that Diablo 2 has a release date. Yes. Not just a coming out this year, actual release date. Yep. So that's a thing I'm very... It's definitely a, well, they've already got my money, damn it. Yeah, and what's exciting about uh, Diablo 2 Remastered is not only is it coming out, I believe, in September... It is, September, yes. It is cross-platform, which is yep. very exciting because I don't know that we've properly said it on the podcast yet, but Jeff and I have plans to stream that entire game together because we're both diehard Diablo 2 fans, fans mm -hmm. of the entire series. And the fact that it's cross-platform means if I buy it on PC, which is probably my intent, and you buy it on PlayStation or you, you know the Xbox, whatever you buy it on, we'll still be able to play it together. And if I decide that I'd rather buy it on my PS5, it won't hinder the ability to do that. Correct. Whether or not we start streaming it September 23rd, the <laughs> announced release date of Diablo 2 Resurrected, or a few days after, it will come. Yeah. That's that's a day one purchase for both of us. Hell yes. And like the fact that you're going to be able to import your old save files if you still have them, you'll be able to turn on and off the HD graphics. You can revert it back to the original look of the game. All the DLC is included. Like, it's it's very exciting to see a game like that and also get featured during the Xbox showcase because Blizzard didn't really have a presence here. Like there were some updates about Overwatch and a few other things, but none of it really tied to E3 itself. And so I was concerned that we wouldn't hear anything about Diablo 2. So it was fun to get that information during this presentation. And, and the crossplay did make me very excited because also it means I will probably end up buying it on multiple platforms because... If the Switch version is cross-play and I can play it portably, like, and bring my Switch to your house to play with you, like, it's just, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's kind of the the frontier of cross-play is one of the big movements right now mm -hmm. that is something that is a thing of larger studios can seem to be a little more able to make it happen. I imagine there's a lot of playing ball that goes on between consoles to make this happen. So hopefully that trickles down a little further. There's probably a few indie games that cross play that I'm not thinking of right now, but that's that's definitely the fun announcement announcement about things because everything else has become so segmented, so service based, so everything else that that is a tangible bit of progress that feels really good. Yeah, and oh, like it, it just feels good. And a bunch of games have announced it recently. Overwatch announced it after a long time without. Uh, Destiny 2 announced it as well. Like these are giant games, especially Destiny 2, which is free on PS4 right now if you have PS Plus. And like if you have friends who've been playing for ages on PC, you can't play with them. Like this kind of update is really important. Before we move on to other stuff, I do want to shout out um, that we still have no release date for Halo Infinite. It's still nebulously this holiday. Come on. Like I don't understand this thing about Microsoft only because it's not like we don't know it's coming out at Christmas, right? Like, just say Christmas. We understand that it was supposed to come out in early fall. It was supposed to come out early this year. Like, it's not coming out to the end of the year. We know. Stop saying the holiday. 
And like they did make a big thing about how the multiplayer is going to be free to play separate from the campaign, which is good news because also PC and Xbox players will be able to play together, which is a really big deal. I've always loved the Halo multiplayer, though I am terrible at it. And the idea of being able to play with friends no matter where they are will make it more accessible for a lot of folks. But like, it feels like they just keep dragging their heels with it. And they can, like, I thought for sure at E3, we would get an actual finite release date. But I think they're just afraid that if they give it and then have to push back again, like, I think they're trying to save their ass in case they have to push it out again, which there is a chance of that happening. And I mean, considering the fact that it's better to have less to say and be more concrete rather than putting out information that you then have to walk back. Yeah. Is especially in the current climate of news and announcements and hype. I mean, any amount of watching the public streams and everything else. I love community. I love community so much. I just turned off the chat. Yeah. Oh, you have to. I had to. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm, sh- and I'm sure many do. Yeah. It's there's just a certain amount of like, you know what? I can understand being like being a little coy with it. It's frustrating. But also, I, I can be a little more objective because I don't care about Halo. I care about that grappling hook. That was pretty it, cool. It did look really cool. Um, I, I my, my notes on this was just literally Halo Infinite. Grappling hook. <laughs> and I moved on. Yeah. Uh, if I'm watching a talk over of a presentation from a streamer that I like, I'll be in chat. But if I'm looking at the main yes. presentation itself. Never. Never in a million years. I always minimize it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, all in all, what I did like about Xbox is unlike other presentations, I did feel like Xbox was especially towards the middle and the end was punchy enough that they Mm -hmm. were jumping from trailer to trailer and it was hard to get bored. In the beginning, it started a little slow, but then it kind of picked up pace. It did. The next presentation I want to talk about, however, was the Square Enix showcase, which was the exact opposite of that. Yeah. And I think the most severe of the problem you mentioned. So. It's no secret that Jeff and I like Square Enix. We love Final Fantasy and we love the Marvel stuff. We like we love oh, yeah. we love a lot of the stuff that they do. They open the showcase with a trailer for a brand new single player focused Guardians of the Galaxy video game, which was so exciting. I had no idea this was coming out. Turns out a lot of folks in the industry had already known. I was hyped. I'm I'm hyped. Star Lord has an undercut. He flirts with a tentacle. He's going to be the bisexual king we know him to be. Very exciting. The voice actors were great. It looked great. You know, it looked fun for the first two minutes. The, tr- uh-huh. the whole presentation was close to five minutes. And the gameplay looks fun, but not fun enough to watch. It was not dynamic enough to watch. And like for the first time of the whole series of conferences, I was sitting there going, all right, cool. I'm excited. Why are we still watching this? Right. Starting with the trailer, Cold was brilliant. It it blew me away. I was really excited. And then showing maybe a little bit of gameplay later, great. But to do it all together and just kind of drag it out didn't really seem to make a lot of sense. And you felt it. It just slowed down the whole presentation. Yeah, and they never really picked up the pace after that. Some exciting stuff, but never got it back no and the problem is also is the guardians of the galaxy was the most exciting thing they announced because everything after that was kind of like well first of all they announced they are re-re-releasing the first six final fantasy games they are not doing the the shitty cell blending pixel crap that we've complained about they are updating the sprites however it is not a bundle they are all still being sold individually again and they are only coming to mobile and Steam, where they already all exist. The first two don't. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. That is, that's my contribution to the knowledge here. Yeah, you can only get from Final Fantasy three onwards. Okay. So it's it's a way to get some of those releases. It's like, okay, cool. The other thing is, did you get to, because they didn't reveal the sprites in the trailer. No, yeah. They were just like, pixel remaster. Yeah. And I have been following with great interest the reveals on those, and- the the look of the pixels they're not it's not a one to one no it's it's not as ugly let's be real it's not as ugly as the way the final fantasy 6 final fantasy 5 steam releases look but also i don't know why they would need to feel they had to simplify it or something for phone release but i don't know i don't know and then they announced the final fantasy origins the team ninja game yeah which Cool, exciting. I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna check it out. I'm gonna follow it with great interest. But it's another one. It's like, all right, cool, cool, cool. 
<laughs> yeah, and it all feels a little over long. And again, maybe it's just my own emotional sense or, or attention span. It's just kind of like, cool, great, next. You're not doing anything interesting enough for this. Yep. It's kind of a flip side on things. Of I noticed something interesting uh, from the press side where we did get a lot of cool emails from indie developers and different studios behind games that they're putting out. There was a specific uh, developer uh, publisher uh, based out of Europe, I think, that sent us trailers for a couple of games that are coming out. And I realized after a little bit that they are all like kind of the same animation style and they're very much the story of the game. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm not at all interested in this. I was from the title and the description. Then I watched the trailer and I went, I don't care. And then I went onto the Steam page and there were gameplay trailers and then I got excited again. <laughs> and like many times, I don't know if I have a conclusion here, but that is something I observed. And I think there are similar feelings there that come from those sort of like haphazard, certainly what Square Enix was doing with their presentation. Yeah, totally. And like, I don't know, just to be a, a Final Fantasy super fan for a sec. I just don't understand why you would re-release those games on the two platforms that they are, most of them already are and not put them on the Switch or PlayStation or Xbox. It just doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense to me. What I mean, I, also, I've been screaming into the void for Super Mario RPG and Chrono Trigger to be released also. Like, I just don't understand how Square makes these decisions. But yeah, that conference ended up being a bit of a letdown. And like, even Origins, which looks interesting... It does. We don't learn or know anything. Like we see a little bit of gameplay. It looks like a Dark Souls or a Devil May Cry kind of thing. There's some FF1-ish references going on within it, which is like, that was the most compelling part to me. Yeah. Between that and action RPG, like that's it. Uh, the minute the guy in the giant suit of armor that looked familiar walks out, I'm like, okay, now I'm interested. But when the blonde Chad swinging a giant sword in a t-shirt in a Final Fantasy game, it's like, what are we doing? <laughs> Um, hey, you know, it's fewer belts. That's true. You want to be meme-tastic about it. Right. And also, he didn't have the upgrades, right? It was probably a basic shirt, a linen shirt, right? Exactly. I, anyway, I'm excited about the Guardians of the Galaxy game. It's also coming out this October, which is really exciting because I didn't know about it. And now it'll be out in a few months. We don't get a lot of announcements like that from the AAA studios. Um, that's true. And so that's really exciting. Before we go on to one of the other big showcases, I do want to talk briefly about a game I saw at the PC Gaming Show, which was on Twitch. It's a game called Citizen Sleeper. It looks like this kind of social and visual novel-esque game. It takes place in kind of a steampunky future. It seems mm -hmm. like you either loop time or lead multiple lives. It was just really interesting. Mm. I don't have a ton of information on it, but if you Google Citizen Sleeper game, you should be able to find it. Something to keep an eye out for. Something I'll definitely come back to. It looked like it's going to be a lot of fun and then the future game show i didn't pay a ton of attention by that time i was kind of a little burned out but there's a game called severed steel that looks really good that looks like it's super hot meets like an arcadey first person shooter game meets john wick it was very stylish very cool all those games mixed with like bullet storm because you're like getting points for creative kills it just looked mm -hmm. really ridiculous and a lot of fun that was a standout that i wanted to make sure that i mentioned but I would love for you, Jeff, to talk a little bit about the indie game showcase that you watched, and specifically also the limited run games, because I hear, and I watched it after the fact, they had a lot of really good stuff, both in physical, of course, which is your jam, but also just in general, games getting ported to other consoles, games that had never been released on consoles before and things like that, remasters and the like. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the limited run games, yeah, I... I, I will never be coy about how much I love that limited run games, and... Other services, sites, companies like it exist, like Special Reserve Games and other ones that I'm blanking on right now, but those are the two that I check the most. And Perfect. yeah, the fact that limited run games, in addition to some of the expected stuff, like I think as of right now, they're still taking pre-orders for the Castlevania Anniversary Collection on physical. They followed up with Contra. Now that they, they've announced Castlevania Requiem, the Symphony of the Night and Rondo of Blood Collection are also going to be physical. I own most of these, but am I going to get them physical? I'm not sure yet, but I want to. But also, they then have followed, because it was a very fun give and take. Mm -hmm. And also the presentation in between was very funny, very quick. They, from the get-go, played into technical difficulties and glitches and things going wrong. 
and it was a lot of fun. And one of my favorite gags was they showed off a game, and it's like, yeah, but what about the gameplay? Let's see some gameplay. They showed gameplay footage in the trailer, but it then cuts to a guy just standing there. The camera's on him, like, slack-jawed playing the game. And so you still hear the music from, like, a TV far away, and you just have a solid 30 seconds of watching, as the title card said, Maximum Jeff playing the game. So nice. everyone was very excited about Maximum Jeff. But they followed up the Konami announcements with the fact that they were doing a Turbo Graphics release of Dracula X Rondo of Blood. And something I, I think is so cool, especially as a retro collector, that Limited Run Games has been able to, has the clout, has the capital, whatever, whatever it is, is able to release older games on their original medium. Yeah. Either because it was difficult to get them, they are releasing Zombies Ate My Neighbors and Ghoul Patrol, the sequel, on SNES, Genesis, on the on those as well as more modern systems. And finding a copy of Ghoul Patrol is wild. <laughs> so I love being able to do that. When they released Shantae way back when on, the, on a Game Boy Color cartridge, I didn't get it because I had most of the other games on Switch and I just went with that. But the fact that that you can now, instead of spending almost $1,000 on the game, you can just get it. Yeah. They made their final announcement, Plumbers Don't Wear Ties, which if you don't know anything about Plumbers Don't Wear Ties, listeners, look it up. <laughs> if you ever thought you had strong opinions about FMV games and their ilk and their ills, Plumbers Don't Wear Ties, baby. <sighs> <laughs> But there was a lot of good stuff. They announced Shantae coming out on PS5. And I'm not sure if they're doing separate titles for each of them or you can get a Shantae collection. I'm not sure. You know, the fact that they have to... The digital games come out first and then they announce the physical. There is a certain amount of, do I have to buy the game twice already? So I don't know where that's going to end up. But it was... It's very cool. It's how I first saw a trailer for Skatebird. And I'm very excited about Skatebird. I, I have now seen it, and I now know that you can be all kinds of birds playing basically Tony Hawk in, like, miniature. It feels like Katamari Tony Hawk, <laughs> and that's incredible. Is that for everybody? I don't care. It's for me, and I'm getting it. I was very excited about it. And there was just some good stuff, and the indie showcase was so refreshing. There was some great stuff. I'm so happy that you got to have that interview with uh, the team behind Bark. Because when I saw the footage for that, I was I was like, oh, this is incredible. Then realized you'd already talked to these guys. And I got super excited. They called it themselves like kind of a shoot 'em up for dads because yeah. it's a couch co-op game. And you can kind of asynchronously help each other out, which is great because I love shoot 'em ups. I'm not great at them, but I love them. And I'm slowly acclimating my spouse to them as well because she enjoys a lot of games similar to it. And it's just kind of a. Just get past some of the trappings here, and I think you're really going to like what the game is. So I think that's going to be a really good one for the both of us. I loved how many games had cats in them. So many. Between Neko, Ghost Jump, Cat Cafe Manager. There's a few others that I'm probably blanking on that are all throughout. But those two, I just went, a lot of cats here. <laughs> Not mad. I'm just, I'm just noticing it. I'm very excited about Dark Deity. Like, very Fire Emblem, strategy RPG. But no, it's definitely one where, yeah, I was more excited about the the interesting artistic directions, the really weird, like, Moolander, which I believe they actually called a Mootroidvania, yes. where you are on Mars flying around exploring, and there's just hell cows everywhere. And I don't know how I'm going to feel about it, but... I'm more intrigued by that than so many other games that are going to be coming out. I mean, I think E3 wasn't going to change my mind about the the smaller studios or where my heart lies. I'm still going to get bigger budget games, and I still have those series that I follow and I like. But, I mean, uh, Hooded Horse Games announcements during that, they were all like space strategy games. And I'm like, that's going to excite a bunch of people that I know. I I, <laughs> I barely took notes on it. I was just like, uh, yeah, the whole time. But there's there's some great stuff. There's, yeah. a, there's a lot of great stuff. Totally. Some of my favorites from Limited Run Games was, of course, I went nuts on Twitter because they are remastering the 2D side-scrolling third game in the series of Blood Rain, Blood Rain Betrayal, Fresh yeah. Bites. 
A Blood Rain, a series that I've really loved for a long time. I had no idea that Laura Bailey was the voice of Rain. Of course she is, though. It's the of fact course. that in the remaster, they're bringing her in to do a ton of voice acting mm -hmm. and reprise the role. This came out, I think, about six or seven years ago on the 360 PS3 generation, and I completely missed it. And so the fact that Same. it's getting remastered and coming out on the... Like, this is a perfect Switch game, in theory... There are plenty of simplistic games that don't run well on the Switch. We've had our issues with side-scrolling games running well on Switch. But that said, I'm excited that this is getting a re-release. And also, I just got the kick in the ass that I need to finally play River City Girls because River City Girls 2 is coming out. And that's going to have online co-op, which the first one did not. Yes, and I'm very excited about River City Girls 2. And again, in that like repackaging thing, they're doing a collection that is Double Dragon and Kunio-kun. Yeah. And Kunio-kun being Crash and the Boys, being River City Ransom and where all of that came from. I wasn't necessarily going to go out and get Dodgeball, but if I get it as part of a thing, and I don't know if that's out digitally or not, but there's a lot to be excited about there. And I am very excited about Blood Rain Betrayal. That's a series I didn't quite get into. One that I knew that I would enjoy its atmosphere, its trappings, but I think it was coming out around when I was still like a generation behind on mm -hmm. my game collecting. I've only caught up like in the last five, 10 years. So if it was a hot new thing on PS3 or 360, I missed it. Yeah, and I mean, all, it's catching up now. <laughs> I mean, on the PS2, some of my favorite games were those 3D action games like Blood Rain, like Blood Omen, like Soul Reaver, mm -hmm. like all those games. And um, oh yeah, I just realized that the company that made that game and then doing the remaster also did remasters of Blood Rain 1 and 2, Blood Rain 1 Terminal and Blood Rain 2 Terminal. And they're both on oh, Steam, wow. which I didn't know. And so I may pick those up because, of course, I want to play through all of them, right? I have to. It's like a rule. Yeah, I, I, I mean, maybe it's time for me to check them out. Um, but, yeah, that was really exciting for me. And then, of course, like, you know, getting to see a bunch of indie games that, like, I just didn't know a lot about. And then getting to chat with folks who make them. You mentioned Bark earlier, which is a shoot 'em up or shmup, as apparently they call them, which I didn't know. Yep. Is shmup. in the interview they say, and you'll hear hear this for the most part as long as it made the audio came through, that they wanted to make one that's more accessible. Like folks love Cuphead, and Cuphead's a great game, but they wanted one that people can pick up and play, that they're not screwed if they die, and that they can learn and grow with. And that there are different difficulty modes. But you don't have to play on those higher difficulties. You know, you may not get a hidden character or something, but like they're not going to lock the story behind it, which is really great and really exciting. Yeah, it's the Kirby mindset. Yes. Which I always enjoy where can you beat the game? Yeah, that's easy. Can you get everything? Good luck. Yeah. Uh, another game that you hadn't brought up yet that I got to also do a talk with was Cormon, which what I love about Cormon, and I highly recommend that you go check out their trailer and they do have a demo out on Steam is that it is it is impossible to not compare it to Pokemon. Oh, yeah. But what sets it apart is not only are there a larger variety of monsters, I feel like, that you catch, but the bosses are all monsters you can't catch. They are called Titans. They're part of the world and part of the story. There's a deep lore of this game. When you create your character, you can literally create a character. You pick the skin color. You pick the hair. You pick the outfit. You pick accessories like glasses and a hat. Like, it really has a 16-bit looking character creator. And then on top of that is that there's puzzle solving in the dungeons. Like this mm. is Pokemon meets Zelda meets so many other things. And I think if you're going to do a game like this, you have to take it to another level. They said that it's between 40 and 50 hours long. And the demo is up to, I think, 8 or 10 hours. Whoa. Yeah, that's really impressive, especially from an indie team. And the art is gorgeous. And what made me really love it, Jeff, is something that we've talked about a lot, is when indie games create in a style of a system and then break those boundaries, like Shovel Knight. Looks like it's a Super Nintendo game, but obviously could never run on a Super Nintendo. All the same, this also looks like it would be on the Game Boy Advance, but the detail, the sound, the way the sprites look absolutely could not run on a Game Boy Advance, but it gives that vibe. And that also made me really excited about it. Yeah, well, especially because the Game Boy Advance was kind of Super NES, but actually a little more powerful. Yeah. And this kind of continues that. And no, you're right. Coromon is, when you look at it, if you haven't seen a trailer yet, if you haven't checked out the demo yet, you watch it and you immediately feel like someone's about to get sued. <laughs> but the thing is, also, they're able to, without being beholden to, to all of that, they can do whatever they want with it. They can do something like it. The amount of games that are like other games is innumerable and inevitable. So the fact that you can have those puzzles, you can have those bosses, those are the kinds of things that I've definitely played Pokemon and went, 
I like this game and I'm going to keep playing it, but you know, it'd be cool. And they're getting to do that. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. I love that. I'm very excited to, to learn more about the game as it comes out and to pour God, a weekend into the demo. Jeez. All right. Yeah. And announcement that they told me when I recorded the interview, but we couldn't tell until now is that not only is it coming to steam, but they've officially secured the rights to put it on the switch as well. And so I'm going to buy this game on the Switch. It's a Pokemon-like game on the system I'm playing my Pokemon games. And what I really love about the game, too, is that it is pushing to places that Temtem last year was trying to push and a bunch of other games. Pokemon doesn't own the right to Monster Trainer games. In fact, they never are did. they never did. Games like Monster Rancher and Digimon, which have seen some resurgence, like there was a big Digimon game on the Switch a couple years ago. They're just Pokemon is the most well known, but it's not the only one. And so I'm so excited that Cormon is coming because I want this to be a success. So we get more games like this. Give me more monster training games. Let's make Pokemon not the ubiquitous choice. Let's make other games competitive because Yes, when we talk about shooters, we think of Doom and we think of Call of Duty and we think of Battlefield, but like we think of so many other games now too, like Borderlands, like Bulletstorm. There are indie first-person shooter games. Those are the biggest names, but they're not the only name. And I would love for Pokemon to not be the only name and for these other companies to become more ubiquitous with the style of game. And it's looking like Cormon is going for that. They are looking to become a name in the space and they have the potential to do it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a slightly more even playing field in terms of showcases that go on and trailers that people get to see because, you know, so many games. But, you know, I, I personally would really like that. Before we start to wrap things up, we have to talk about Jeff and I's favorite presentation because it is the company that we never shut up about. Um, the Nintendo Direct was probably pound for pound the best presentation because of how it was structured. It was, Nintendo knows at this point, we're gonna show you a bunch of commercials, you're gonna get excited, and then we're gonna move on. And it was great. They opened with the new Smash character as they often do now. And let me tell you when my jaw dropped. So before we watched the presentation, friend of the show, <laughs> the incredible Merit K tweeted, I want Hihachi to be the new Smash character and that their final Smash be them dropping people in volcanoes, which is such a great tweet. Yes. When the trailer begins, we see a volcano and I start freaking out. I'm like, oh my God, did Merrick call it on the head? So close. The son of Haihachi, Kazuya, is the new Smash character. And literally 90% of the trailer was a montage of him dropping different people in a volcano. It was perfect. It was great. And especially because, you know what? Hihachi has been in Soul Calibur, and I know Tekken and Soul Calibur, they, they get along so well because same company and all that, but let Kazuya have his time. He has a devil form. Let's go with that. I didn't see Merritt's tweet, but when it got to that and we were getting excited, and then I just saw, because the first character Kazuya throws off the cliff is Ganondorf. Right. And I just saw, like, the body being carried, and I just, not even thinking, went, wait a minute. Is this Tekken? Oh my God, are they? And they did it, and that was the thing. They opened with that. It's not a game announcement. It's DLC, which, you know, feel how you feel about it. But they knew what they were doing, and they finished it off with him throwing Kirby off the cliff. And I remember being there like, come on, wait for it. Wait for it. Like, Kirby didn't fall because Kirby can fly. Yeah. I was like, yes, that's how you do this. And yeah, no, Nintendo, as we said at the start of the episode, they've been honing their their digital drops yep. through Nintendo Direct for years and years. So this was just more of the same. It was efficient. It was good. I felt I had enough time and space to get excited about all of the announcements that, well, I was getting excited about. They weren't overly coy about anything, which is the other difficulty you run into with trailers and things like that. You just sit there and it's like, oh, what is it? Oh, what is it? Oh, what, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? I've been waiting for this for the last three minutes. This is getting uncomfortable. <laughs> what is it going to be? And even saying what it is at the top of the trailer, it's not a spoiler. No. You're about to find out what it is. <laughs> We're about to get excited about it. Just let's be excited. Like, okay, you know, they got the little goofy music and coming up next kind of thing about it, but it flowed well. 
it went right. And I'm excited about some of the things they announced and some of the unexpected things too. Yeah. First for expected, we knew about this from the Ubisoft presentation, which we kind of glanced over because neither Jeff or I were really that into it. Um, was yeah. the one game I am interested in, Mario and Rabbids 2. Spark of Hope, they are going into space. And honestly, that's the most tropey thing you could do. And this series is all about tropes. I'm so glad we're getting a second one of these games. I have yet to finish it, but I loved what I played of the first one. It's so tongue in cheek. And of course, we talked about it at length with our new best friend, the incredible Grant Kirkhope, who was on the show talking about his music. And he is, of course, coming back to the, do the music for the second one. And closer to release, we'll have to have him back to talk about it. Right. But that was really fun for me to see. I love that there's a rabid Rosalina and that she can't give a damn about anything. Like, it, it just it looks so much fun. The rabid Lumas are cute. I'll say it. Like, I don't like the rabbits, but the rabid Luna are just cute. They just are. I've always liked the rabbits, and I will die on that hill. That's fine. I mean, I like them now. I like them in this series. And so that was really exciting. We got more stuff about Mario Golf, which was also exciting. That game looks like a lot of fun. It looks like it's taking the arcadiness of Mario Kart and bringing it to the Golf series. They're also, for mm -hmm. the first time, on a console doing a RPG style adventure mode with your me the game boy and game boy advance games were famous for their rpg portions and so it's cool that the, to see the console version is getting that but the one that i really want to talk about is the one that jeff knows that i'm most excited about so there have been rumors mingling for a long time that even though metroid prime 4 was nowhere near completed the metroid prime trilogy is in this weird limbo because of complications with porting the third game and all of this is just rumors so take it with a grain of salt there were murmurs for a long time that there was a 2D Metroid in the works. We had never gotten any proof of it. You know, it had always been whispers. And during this presentation, they debut the fifth Metroid game. They use the words Metroid 5, which make it take place after my favorite Metroid game, Metroid Fusion, which the incredible Travis Colnut did an episode of SideQuest on, that we are finally getting the rumored Metroid Dread, the fifth game in the side-scrolling series of Metroid games, Jeff knows that the side-scrolling Metroid games are my favorite. I've still yet to play the Prime games, which I will eventually when that collection comes out because we know it's coming. But I, when I tell you I got so excited watching this trailer, it just, this was my moment of E3. And the reason it was is because it is the most fun when you get to be surprised about something you never expected. And yeah. this was something I never expected. And it looks good. It looks fun. It's picking up the mantle of a series that I love. It's what E3 is about for me as a consumer, is the surprising moments that just floor you. And Guardians of the Galaxy was one of them. And this was the other. I never expected that this would be a reality. And that it's coming right before my birthday on October 8th uh, is just incredible. It is. It is. And I love the cheekiness of calling it Metroid Dread, yeah. which was a rumored title for a while. They even made an in-joke about it in one of the Metroid Prime games. And I have a quiet but fervent love for Metroid games, especially the side-scrolling ones. I played Prime, but I share your love of these games, and that also was a definite, I wasn't expecting it, it floored me. And I'm looking over kind of the list that I made of the Nintendo Direct, and I see they did a really nice job of, you know, because it's Nintendo and it's the Switch, so there's a certain amount of, we're excited to announce this four-year-old game is finally coming to Switch. Yeah. But they balance those with new titles. They balance first party and third party. There was a nice ebb and flow, which feels like damned by faint praise. But when you watch an entire weekend of these streams, you appreciate that so much. Yeah. I was excited to see Cruise and Blast as a thing. I wasn't a huge cruising guy, but I love that it was happening and like that's cool. But that let me kind of come down a little bit. Dragon Ball Kakarot. All right, cool. Yeah, that's coming. That'll be great. Mario Golf Super Rush. All right, I'm excited again. It was a nice rise and fall. They had a little horror block with Shin Megami Tensei, Danganronpa, and Fatal Frame. This sounds like fanboyism, and it is. But I think Metroid Dread was probably, yeah, I think I agree. That's probably the, the big surprise one from a major presentation. Let me start the wrap up here and ask you this. Was there a game that you did not know anything about beforehand? You learned about it through watching the trailer or hearing them talk about it and immediately went, well, I need that. I need like it. It, it floored you. 
I mean, it's tough, right? There are so many games. I mean, I mentioned Citizen Sleeper before, which is something I'd never heard of that looked really cool, an indie title. Really quick before we get into the wrap-up, I do want to mention they did do another Breath of the Wild 2 tease. This game is not coming anytime soon. They said next year. If it comes out before Christmas of next year, I will be shocked because I really don't think it's happening. But it was fun to see more stuff. They showed off more mechanics. It looks like it's going to have some time travel nonsense in it. Like, I'm really excited for it. But talking about my favorite thing... I mean, I think it has to be Metroid Dread just because I really didn't think I was ever going to get another 2D Metroid. Just all of the hype of Metroid Prime 4, the fact that they keep teasing that we're going to get this HD collection of a game series that I never played because I stubbornly stomped my foot at it, which was dumb. And I've heard that it's good and I will eventually play it now, especially since it's eventually going to come to the Switch. But like I never really, I just really gave up on getting a new side-scrolling Metroid game. And, you know, Jeff and I talk about Metroidvanias more than any other franchise on this podcast just about. And I really had my reservations that it wasn't happening. Um, I'm so excited that this game is coming out that I dusted off my 3DS and purchased without a second thought uh, Samus Returns, which was the remake of the Game Boy game, which I never played. I did play the original Game Boy game, which I loved, but I never played the remake. And then this morning, I, by totally legal means, within my abilities, legitimately started replaying Metroid Zero Mission, which is a remake of the original Metroid, so I can play that going into Samus Returns. And also through totally legal and legitimate means... Got access again to Metroid Fusion, my favorite of these Metroid games, which I'm going to replay closer to the release of Dread. I did replay Super Metroid last year, or was that early this year? Who knows? Time is a leak. But I streamed that, and I loved I loved Super Metroid. I think it's aged the poorest of the original games, besides 1 and 2, because 1 and 2 are really old games. But like Super Metroid, the mechanics towards the end of the game, the wall jump, some of that stuff just doesn't work as tightly as I remembered it working. Um, but that said, it is, it is still one of my all-time favorite Metroid games, but Fusion is Super Metroid, but better. It is literally the same formula with horror elements, and that's why it's my favorite, but I'm getting off track. The point is, Metroid Dread is absolutely my, that game of the show. The runner-up, as I said earlier, is Guardians of the Galaxy, because I had no idea that was coming too, and I want more Marvel single-player experiences, because I loved Avengers, but the best part about it was the single-player campaign. The rest of it was... Not good. And so this showed that Square Enix doesn't just have the keys to the kingdom for Avengers, this action, the you know, this live service game. They have the keys to the kingdom for Marvel games, period. And that we're going to get more of them. And they're not going to just be Spider-Man. I love Insomniac Spider-Man games. Both of them have been great. But I just assumed we were getting Avengers forever because it's live service. And we're getting Spider-Man games forever because they have had cliffhangers and they've not been coy about the fact that they're making another one, as we may or may not have some insight to in a future episode. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. So I just had reserved myself to that. So the fact that this Guardians of the Galaxy game is coming out with choices and branching paths and all this cool stuff really is like, okay, Marvel is going to be making more stuff. Give me a Marvel universe that's just the games, like they did the movies and they did the comics. I want it. Like, do that. Yeah, it's it's more sustainable than the films. For sure. But Dread is definitely my game of the show, my surprise of the show. I'm so excited. Again, I, I was so excited. I spent money on another game to play in anticipation of it. I just, I love this series so much. I don't talk about it enough on the show because, again, I'd reserve myself to my favorite versions of that game being dead, you know, that we weren't getting more of it. And now that, I, that they're making Dread means that they will absolutely hopefully make more of them and that I don't have to give up and there may someday be a Metroid 6 and so you bet your ass I'm going to be talking about them a lot more in the future. But Jeff, as we wrap up, what was your surprise of the show? I know you talked a lot about indie stuff and the things you loved and we were we were pretty in sync on a lot of stuff, but was there a standout surprise of the show that either is like, I have to buy that day one, or this makes me want to get that console, or this is like a game franchise I never expected that I would love, and now I really am excited. Yeah, yeah. I'll wrap up on the Metroid Dread thing. Watching it, it was one of my favorite things of Nintendo franchises, where there is such an obvious and hindsight thing about what they do, where you see Metroid Dread and you went, oh, 
Samus Returns was a warm-up, wasn't it? Yeah, because it, the graphics looked the same. The layout looked the same. I'm into that. I was so delighted. Probably of the larger ones, that was my favorite surprise. I had never heard of Neko Ghost Jump and seeing like a cat former, cat platformer with some Super Paper Mario perspective flip going on. Very cool. Very happy. I liked it a lot. I think the game that I saw the trailer and I just had... I don't like reaction videos and I'm not one who's going to make reaction videos, but this is the one that would be my reaction video was during the Devolver Digital presentation, which again, I will still say, if you haven't watched it, people watch it. It's so good. When they announced Inscription, which I hadn't heard of, maybe they'd announced it before. I just was like, oh, this is so cool. This is so stylish. Oh, it's a card base. It's an adventure. What is that thing in the background? Oh my God. Oh my God. (laughs) I had one of those sort of journeys watching this. And it came later on in the Devolver Digital where I'm already just like, God damn it, they're coming for me. Fuck. Sort of thing. So I would say that is the one that I just, it knocked me out. I'm following it with great anticipation now. Inscription looks really awesome. A future friend of the show, I'll say, because he hasn't been on yet, but I'd love to have him on. Eric Van Allen, who writes for Destructoid and is one of the hosts at Normandy FM and has been on Reignite. He shared that on Twitter and I saw it and I just fell in love. I had missed the Devolver Digital Showcase as it happened. I ended up going back and watching it. But he shared that and I went, okay. Because for me, I like card games. We've talked about this. At much, at, to much to my dismay, I loved the card game in King of Cards, which kills me because right. I, I have a love-hate relationship with card games because I spent a lot of money <laughs> on Magic growing up and I don't have a lot of those cards anymore. It's a complicated history. There's trauma. Leave me alone. Shared. <laughs> Shared. But... Seeing and what does bring me in to want to play card games is card games with a twist. And I don't mean like freaking Kingdom Hearts making a card game because that game had its problems. But anyway, yes, be upfront that it's a card game and then give me other things. And the fact that this looks like a horror game and has really cool, you know, very monochromatic layouts and looks really artistic, like that's how you get me invested in a card game. And Inscripted absolutely did that. It just looked really really hella cool. Yeah, it's a video game card game that does things that a physical card game cannot do. Whether it's giving you story around the game, whether it's doing things with the cards that can't possibly happen. Yeah, I too have spent entirely too much of my childhood money on Magic the Gathering cards, and I still feel that itch and that need for those sorts of games. And so I love that there are games that are like, let's just make it something bigger, make it a kind of a thing. Yeah, King of Cards is great. I, and I'm super excited about Inscription coming up. Love that, yeah. I I think that ultimately for me, E3 had a ton of really standout moments, but the times I was the happiest is when I was surprised by something. Yes. The reason Forza Horizon 5 stands out for me is because I gave up, like Metroid, I gave up on racing games like besides Mario Kart I was like they don't make need for speed or burnout games anymore really Midnight Club that kind of game doesn't exist and then I played on a whim for because I had on Game Pass for free and I was like oh this is exactly my shit and so for the sequel to not only look even more gorgeous which I didn't think was possible to make me want to buy a Series X which of course I'm going to struggle to find like everybody else right But the fact that it made me interested in buying a console that up until this point, I was like, oh, I don't know that I need one. And not because of exclusivity, because it'll probably be on PC, more so because, oh, this is something I just want to vibe to and just play and not share and just have a chill game. Like that kind of realization and those kinds of realizations were great. Your emotional roller coaster for Inscripted is exactly how I witnessed Dread. You know, what I love about the magic of E3 is when you're really excited about something, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, I'm sure there are folks who are super jazzed about Halo Infinite. And the fact that they don't have a release date, they don't care. They got an in-depth talk about the multiplayer and all this other stuff. We've talked about this multiple times. SideQuest exists as a celebration of games at its purest form. And I feel like when you get to those moments in E3, it is unlike anything else. And to know that I have a game coming out this October that, you know, it's been 19 years since I've gotten a game like it. And it's going to be on my console that I have is super exciting. Ultimately, this E3 is unlike any other E3 that came before. I hope that Jeff and I get to cover next year's E3 in person. That would be a blast. But we are going to make an effort to try and cover events, do more press stuff, 
do more live event stuff. We don't know what form that's going to take as the world starts to open up. But I can tell you that Jeff and I have big plans for Extra Life this year. We've talked about it. We've talked about it with the Sarah that lives with him. I hate to say your Sarah because she doesn't belong to you. No. She's her own woman. Sarah Moonen. Sarah Moonen. We've talked about it with Sarah Moon and my spouse, Sarah Storm. We've also talked about it with the incredible Rachel Quirky Shank and her partner, John Henry. Like, we're planning something big for this year's Extra Life. And we are going to plan more big live event things and streams and all that kind of stuff because we want to build this stuff out. We've loved doing this kind of stuff for you. And this E3 special is a step in that direction to do more cool stuff with y'all because we love that you're here and we're thankful that you're here. And we want to hear from you about what you thought of this year's E3. What were the trailers that took you by surprise? How did you feel it all kind of worked out? How much of it could you stand to watch or did you love every minute of it? What are the games that you saw and now they're starting to kind of creep up on you. Now I'm remembering uh, seeing the trailer for Fallen Aces. And yeah. I was a little cool on it when I saw it. But at, the more I think about it, the more I'm kind of excited about a crime noir f FPS. <laughs> it's, it's very classic. It's like I'm not a big FPS guy, but the style's getting me. We want to hear about those sorts of emotional journeys from all of you. And there's a lot of ways you can let us know. You can reach out to us on Twitter, Fun and Games Pod. You can also email us at funandgamespod at gmail.com. And we want to hear about all these things from all of you. Yeah, we have a Discord server. If you go to certainpov.com, there's a permanent invite link there. We recently reorganized the Discord, so the categories are more grouped together. There's a comics section. There's a books section. There's a... TV and movie section. There's a video game section. The conversation has been way more lively lately since we made those changes, which I'm super grateful oh, yeah. for. You know, mostly Alex geeking out about all the modding he's doing, which I'm super jealous of because I'm afraid I'm going to break that stuff. Oh my God, it's so cool. I am gearing up to, I don't like, there's no official announcement on this. I'm sort of setting up my home area to, I want to start streaming collection maintenance. Nice. I'm not yet ready to start getting into modding, but I do want to do some repairs on some systems that I have and going over these kinds of things and getting to see Alex just run rings around my silly ideas. It's, it is so wonderful. Especially I since it. I don't talk to Alex a lot about games, but he is actually a very avid gamer and loves video games. Um, so yeah. hopefully we'll have him on the show in the nearest future. I know that he is working on a side quest for us, so I'm excited about that. But yeah, you can go to our Discord server. It's the best place to interact with us. We're always online because who isn't these days? Exactly. Also, if you have a moment, write us a review on your podcast platform of choice. We prefer iTunes or Apple Pod because that's where like the world lives in podcasting. But anywhere that you can write a review, write us one. If you can't write a review because of your region or because you don't have a platform that allows reviews, write us an email. Write us a review via email. We will read it on the air. We'd love to hear from you. Please interact with us where you can and check out other shows on the Certain POV Podcast Network. We love all those folks. We try and bring them on here when we can. And there's a lot of good stuff to check out there. Absolutely. Whether it's on our website, whether it's on Discord, Twitter, carrier pigeon whatever it is we want to hear from you on all of these things because this is a conversation thank you for being a part of it i'm jeff moonen and i'm matt aka stormageddon and happy gaming Nostalgia is one of the strongest forces in the human psyche and is responsible for the continued existence of some of our favorite fandoms from the minds behind the Dole Up and Dreams podcast and Isolation Cast Voices from Quarantine, Saturday Morning Confidential takes you on a deep dive into the properties that helped influence the artists and creators of today. So whether you are a Goonie, a Gem Girl, a Digi Destined, or you just want to return to Oz, new episodes release on Fridays bi-weekly starting January 1st of 2021. And join us on the Wednesdays after the main show for the Serial Killer Radio Hour, where we sit down with the people responsible for the toys, shows, and fandoms that you love. Now you can find Saturday Morning Confidential at certainpov.com backslash smcpod or on your favorite podcast platforms. So don't forget to tune in for another deep dive into the files of Saturday Morning Confidential. CPOV. CertainPOV.com.